So, you know, so far tonight, um, we've heard about young people, students, um, workers and activists being inspired or re-inspired by the Corbyn campaign in Britain. And it's, it's not just young people in Britain. It's, I think it's inspiring young people. It certainly inspired me and, um, and other activists in this room that sort of started ignoring Australian politics and were just fixed on um, Corbyn um, in the UK for a period. Um, and we've also heard, um, you know, how punishing the welfare system is, but um, the how how great it is. Oh, yeah, how great it is that welfare recipients are unionising themselves, as you said, for, um, for lack of a better word, um, to fight back. Um, so my call out to start off with is: workers and students of the world unite, because we have nothing to lose but our smashed avocado. <laughs> Quite literally, won't somebody please think of the children? Um, so this is this thanks to climate change, that's my segue, um, causing um, a long running drought um, in California. Um, plus the fact that avocados require a huge amount of water, which is becoming um, a sought after resource. Um, we are now looking at an endangered meal. Um, or at the very least a very expensive one so you know Melbourne hipsters if you think $25 for a smashed avo on toast is expensive now um, just watch that price continue to rise um, as the degrees warming um, also rises um, you know just thinking ahead about that campaign how about you know make smashed avocado affordable again um, so I, I don't want to go too much um, into climate statistics, they're depressing and we all know about it, um, but I mean, Australia's climate has warmed um, since national records began um, in 1910 um, and increasingly more so since 1950. Um, this includes um, increases in average surface air temperatures, daytime maximum temperatures, um, the duration, frequency and intensity of heat waves has also increased um, across large parts of Australia. And we're also seeing more um, extreme and extended fire seasons. Um, sea surface temperatures are also rising. We've seen back-to-back -back coral bleaching um, that has affected two-thirds of the Great Barrier Reef. And now we're facing this. The Adani, well not this, but you know, um, the Carmichael um, mine, the Adani mining project in Queensland. Um, and I was Googling Adani today. Um, interestingly, Adani is currently fighting the Queensland Environment Department on a separate matter, um, rather than pay a pathetic $12,000 fine um, for polluting the Great Barrier Reef. And this is a breach in um, pollution cap. You know, it's okay if you pollute so much, but if you go, if you pollute too much, then we'll fine you. Um, the mining, Adani reported this breach themselves, has been given a smack on the wrist for $12,000, and now they're fighting against having to pay this $12,000 oh, fine. Um, and yet the Queensland State Government, a Labor State Government, um, has granted Adani free unlimited water um, and are supporting the Carmichael Mine Project, um, which, if built, will be the largest open cut coal mine in the world. In case you didn't know what a piece of coal looks like. Um, the Turnbull government have pledged $1 billion to this project. Um, but the good news so far is that big banks, due to community pressure, um, activists in this room, um, the big banks have refused to fund the project, which is leaving Adani short on dollars. Um, but the outrage is, you know, whether this project goes ahead or not, in the face of catastrophic climate change, we have a Labor state government working with a Liberal federal government to build this coal mine with $1 billion of our money, um, public <laughs> funds, that the Turnbull government denies to education, health, housing um, and welfare. And, you know, while some um, MPs in uh, the federal Labor opposition, um, strangely right-wing MPs, people like David Feeney, um, you know, ties to the SDA, have spoken against the Adani mine on um, environmental grounds. Um, Bill Shorten's comments on the matter and the ALP position on the issue is not to oppose the mine because, hey, coal's bad because climate change. Um, but they are opposing the $1 billion um, in public funds. 
Um, and Shorten has said that if the mine was to go ahead, it would be on the support of private investors, but not the federal Labor government. Um, but he has acknowledged um, that coal mining would still continue under a Labor government. Um, and there's also um, pledge funds to support uh, community renewable energy projects. Um, so the economic future for Gen Y um, is looking pretty bleak at the moment. Um, as Pass has mentioned, the, the $4 path internships, um, we've got rampant, um, well, we just, we just have it, unpaid internships are increasing all the time. Um, and my particular bugbear is unpaid placement. So for any student studying anything in, in health, in social work, um, psychology, or just throwing more law, law, education, you have to do hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of unpaid placement. Um, you know, speaking for myself, I'm studying social work. We've got social work students going into agencies, taking on caseloads, being responsible for the welfare of people, and they're getting unpaid. Um, and I've, you know, I'm a student member of the ASU. I've tried to have this discussion with ASU comrades because obviously that clinical placement is important, but by having unpaid students doing exactly your work, that's that's a downwards pressure on, on their wages and, and their skills. So what's to stop an agency just, you know, churning through however many students go? We don't need to hire these like four full time social workers because the students are going to do it for us. Um, but, so I want to talk about the gig economy, um, because the rhetoric around um, the gig economy um, is being um, pushed as, you know, something hip, um, it's trendy, it's high tech, it's exciting, it's flexible, um, but the reality is that gig work is just a new name for piecework. Um, and piecework is nothing new. Um, it's been around since the mid-1700s. Um, it was a big feature in the sweatshop system. Um, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a fun time for workers. Um, workers um, at, uh, when piecework was um, common were paid by the product they produced. Um, they're not paid an hourly wage. There's no such thing as workplace safety. Um, workers uh, wore no um, protective clothing but wore all the risk. And that is what the gig economy is today. Um, workers provide the capital, the transport, the tools and the clothing necessary to complete the job. Um, workers are taking all the risk. You know the old saying of, you know, the venture capitalists, you know, they take all the risk. That's now the individual worker. Um, the spin is if workers want to be successful in the new gig economy, they need to be smart about how they market themselves. Um, they need to have good communication skills, good networking skills, um, a skill portfolio is the new like trend. It's not a resume, it's the skill portfolio. Um, the gig economy is treating workers like a one person corporation. This is try how I'm trying to get my head around it. Where the individual is responsible for managing everything that a HR department would or the communications department, the marketing department um, would normally take care of. Um, and it's really important to note that the gig economy, it's not just Uber, it's not just Deliveroo or Airtasker or any other app or web-based um, gig work options. Gig work is insidiously creeping into sectors that traditionally provided secure employment. Um, the disability sector and the aged care sector, to name two, um, have now essentially become gig work. Um, in the 1930s, um, during the Great Depression, workers would line up at the gate um, or out, out front of the workplace in the hopes they'd be chosen um, that day for some work. Um, today, disability workers and aged care workers um, aren't lining up out front of the gate, but they're sitting at home um, isolated separately in their own homes, waiting by the phone for a text or a phone call to tell them that, hey, you've got a 15 minute job or a, or a 30 minute job or an hour if they're lucky. Um, so they're not even waiting for the full day's work, they're just waiting for something and then they've got to try and line up all the 15 minute bits they can get that day. Um, the gig economy is the next step um, from rampant casualisation and contract work. 
um, and it's contributing to the rapid rise in underemployment. For the first time, we've seen unemployment go down and underemployment um, keeps going up. Um, and the gig economy is where ne neoliberalism has taken us. It's this full-scale um, deregulation um, where workers um, and professions um, are completely de-skilled. Um, the gig economy is making it harder to organise and to unionise workers. Um, it's putting a downwards pressure on wages and it will, if it just you know, keeps going unchecked, it'll see the end of conditions like sick leave, holiday pay, um, and other conditions that were fought for and hard won by union members. Um, it's actually gotten to the point um, where Phil Lowe, or who I think was Reserve Bank, I think I've got that right, um, is saying that workers should go out and ask for higher, higher wage increases. Um, but I think, you know, a question I'd like to pose is how do we define gig work or gig workers? Um, because at a session I went to the other day, there were entrepreneurial, like micro business types, um, like self identifying as gig workers. Um, and I think if that's the case, then, you know, how does the left relate to this? Because there's a con conflict of class interests within this gig economy of, you know, some people being their own boss and running their business, and, um, and then workers being forced into driving for Uber or Air Tasker because they can't get any other employment. So um, those are some of the questions, I guess, that I have. Um, but how is society going to function um, in this type of economy? Um, what about all the workers that can't access high level skills? Um, one solution that has been raised and is already being trialled in some countries is the universal basic income. Um, Will this benefit workers? Um, is it a way, I've heard this argument, is it a way just to prop up neoliberalism for a little bit longer? Um, in Finland, um, it's the universal basic income is being trialled. Um, their equivalent of the ACTU has opposed it, um, claiming it's taking social policy in the wrong direction. Um, whilst politicians on both the left and the right um, have supported a universal basic income. Um, and, you know, recently I've, I've had someone joke with me, well, you know, if history is repeating, then at least we'll go back to a mostly unionised workforce. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's not guaranteed. Um, it's not going to happen unless we make it happen, unless we go out and organise workers. Um, so there are challenges to casualisation and cuts to wages. Um, Young workers are getting organised, they're getting involved through the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union, um, or RAFWU, um, that is formed to directly challenge the SDA or the shoppies, um, who have a poor, just abominable um, track record of defending young workers, um, and have actively sought agreement, agreements with bosses to cut penalty rates that have left workers worse off. Um, and I think it's a fair argument to say that some of these SDA negotiated EBAs have led directly to the Fair Work decision to cut penalty rates, um, which is hilarious because when that decision came down, the SDA were out front of the Fair Work um, Commission waving their flags. Yeah. Um, so RAFWU's tactic, um, they've registered as an association. Um, they're not registered as a union. They call themselves a union. They are a union. They operate like a union but they're an association, which means they don't need permission, they don't need to give you uh, notice, they just walk straight into a workplace and start talking um, to workers. Um, RAFRU only formed last year, um, and you know they are comparatively small, um, but I think they're punching well above their weight, um, and they are getting wins on the board, um, to the point where the SDA, um, I think, who are afraid of being isolated, um, now want to come in from the cold and they want to re-affiliate with Victorian Trades or Council here in Melbourne. Um, RAFWU members have been helping organise workers to terminate um, old agreements or zombie agreements um, which were paying workers well below award minimums. So most people have this understanding that awards are there to protect workers and, and pay you the minimum but Domino's, Baker's Delight, Subway, um, take your pick, 
um, <coughs> are all paying um, workers well below minimum, below the award. Um, sorry, I've lost where I'm at. Um, and RAFRU are currently sitting at the EBA bargaining table with Coles um, and the SDA trying to get a, a better deal for workers. Um, the Young Workers Centre, um, also based at um, Victorian Trades Hall in Melbourne, have been employing a similar tactic, walking straight into workplaces um, to talk to young retail workers about their rights, um, conditions and penalty rates. Um, and this direct and bold approach um, has been successful enough now that the ACTU have taken notice. Um, and they're now launching a campaign with We Are Union, um, also run from Victorian Trades Hall, um, using these tactics of the direct, the direct approach. So their new campaign is to get volunteers to walk into retail businesses, um, to have discussions with workers about penalty rates, have discussions with bosses about penalty rates, and to get um, shop owners and bosses to sign a pledge to say that we will pledge to continue to pay penalty rates despite the fair work decision. Mm -hmm. Then the ACTU is going to promote um, these businesses on a website that you can go in and see, well, uh, this coffee shop in Geelong pays penalty rates. So it's like a reverse reverse boycott. Mm. Um, so it's sort of, sort of in its early stages. Um, we've had another win um, for climate, win for climate. Um, just in the last week we heard that South Australia will be getting the world's largest solar thermal plant, um, which is a huge win. Um, and it, it's a result um, of years, mm -hmm. years of yeah. um, grassroots community <coughs> campaigning. Um, and the wins that RAFU um, has had in terminating old agreements, um, recruiting new members, is it's both of these examples. It's a, it's a result of collective action and organising. Um, we know that over 70% of people in this country support marriage equality. We know that due to years of grassroots community campaigning on this issue. Um, so the aim of my talk was to make you angry, because if you're not angry, you're not paying attention, um, to give you some signs of hope. There are signs of hope, not just in the UK. UK's Britain, Britain's great. I've got time not to use UK, Britain. Um, but there are, there are signs of hope here as well. Um, but it's also a call to action, um, probably speaking to the wrong crowd, I think. I think most, most people in this room are pretty active. Um, so I've mentioned a few campaigns, Adani, Rafru, Marriage Equality. Um, there are workshops and all these campaigns over this weekend, so if you were just popping in for tonight, I hope I've convinced you to come back um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, and to hear about these campaigns and details from people directly involved in them. Um, but we're not just here to talk about campaigns, we're here to do the campaigns, do the activism. Um, so tomorrow at 1pm um, we're having a Say Yes to Equality Action here at the conference venue. Um, I just want to do a quick plug for this campaign. Um, if you have enrolled to vote and you are going to vote yes, that's great. Um, but the next few weeks are going to be absolutely critical and we need you to do more than enrol and to say that you're voting yes. Um, so there is going to be a field campaign. We need you to pledge to do the door knocking, do the street stalls, come to the rallies um, and, and challenge people that say no, have that conversation. Ask them why. Why are they going to vote no? Um, so this is my closing message. It's on my T-shirt, but if you can't see it... Um, Unfuck the world. This is what Gen Y needs to do because um, there won't be a future to fight for. Thank you. Mm -hmm.